striking now. Down to the set. Setup is very good. About the setup. More stuff from Casey Stoner. And Rossi comes straight back. Yeah, I think we have a pretty good yeah. setting. That we have. If you're into racing, I'm pretty sure you've heard riders talk about the so-called setup of their bike and how this influenced their pace. A layman probably assumes that this so-called setup has all to do with the suspension settings. And this wouldn't be entirely wrong, but there's more to setting up a bike than you might think. Let's have a talk about motorcycle geometry. Entire books have been written about motorcycle geometry and dynamics. These books are not easy to understand, not even for an engineer. Say what now? That's for a good reason though, because motorcycle geometry is not an easy thing to understand. So one YouTube video is not going to make you the next Jeremy Burgess. In this video, I aim to describe the basics of motorcycle geometry. Now if there's one thing that we can take away from all of these books written on geometry, it's this. Any change to the settings of a motorcycle's geometry is going to be a trade-off. So what does that mean? Say you move the fork tubes up in the triple clamps, which is a very common change racers do to their motorcycles, because it makes their motorcycles steering quicker. I mean, that's a good thing, right? Well, moving the fork tubes up in the triple clamps will decrease the trail and decrease the wheelbase, which will indeed make the motorcycle steering quicker. It will also make the motorcycle less stable and potentially harder to control. Moving the fork tubes up also lowers the ride height, which means you might not have enough ground clearance, and it decreases the swing arm angle, which decreases the anti-squat tendency of the bike. Squat refers to the tendency of the rear suspension to compress under acceleration. Countering that tendency is called anti-squat, a characteristic of the chassis that tries to extend the rear suspension on acceleration. So sure, the bike will steer in quicker going into the turn, but you also might not make it out of the turn. You also need to consider that all of these characteristics change when a rider is on the bike and a motorcycle is moving. For instance, the front forks will compress when braking going into a turn, which will cause the same changes in characteristics as moving the fork tubes up in the triple clamps. I'm pretty sure this is you right now. But don't what? worry, by the end of this video these turns will start making a lot more sense to you. To understand a motorcycle's geometry, let's start from the front and work our way backwards. Up front we have the front forks, triple clamps and the wheel. So the front forks are mounted into the triple clamp and the wheel attaches to the lower fork leg. The triple clamp is mounted to the frame at the steering stem. The angle between the steering axis with respect to a vertical line is called rake. The distance between the fork centers and the steering stem is called fork triple clamp offset. The wheel plus tire has a certain diameter, and lastly we come to the most important measure called trail. Trail is a measurement of how far the contact patch of the front tire is behind the point where the steering axis hits the ground. So why is trail so important? Well trail is what makes it possible to stay balanced on two wheels, because it forces the front end to stay in a straight line when the motorcycle is driven forward. The effect is obvious if you have seen a motorcycle going down the track in a straight line when the rider fell off. The bike wants to go in a straight line because of trail. To understand this a bit better, let's compare four very different motorcycles. First up we have a KTM 450 SMR with a trail of 90mm. Then we have an Aprilia RSV4 with a trail of 105mm. Then we have a Ducati Multistrada 1200 with a trail of 109 and then a Harley Davidson Sportster with a trail of 117. So which of these four motorcycles do you think turn in the quickest? Well the KTM is clearly going to turn in real quick because it has a really aggressive trail. The Aprilia is going to come in short thereafter because it has an aggressive trail and it also has a low center of gravity. But let's get into that later. Now the Multistrada and the Sportster are clearly going to turn in slower than both of these two bikes. So why would you ever want more trail than, say, the RSV4? I mean, it's not like people who ride RSVs on the street are flying off the tarmac because it's so unstable. Well, it's not like it's very comfortable riding an RSV4 on a bumpy back road. You see, the environment where the bike will be ridden is very important when you determine the trail that it should have. For instance, off-road versions of the KTM, which has a 21-inch front wheel, has a trail of 110 millimeters. Because the front wheel has a larger diameter, the trail is larger. 
So why would you want a bigger trail on a dirt bike then? Well, on a dirt bike, you want to balance straight line stability with agility. Since these bikes will be ridden over rocks and sand, essentially in environments where the front wheel will be pushed around. You want the bike to help the rider keep it going straight. Now, of course, smart engineers have been working on this for quite some time, and they figured out a way how to make a motorcycle with a very aggressive trail more stable. And that is with a steering damper. Motorcycles that come with a steering damper usually have a trail so aggressive that they would experience head shake going in a straight line, but the damper keeps this in check. Now let's talk about the rear of a motorcycle. Remember I mentioned that thing called anti-squat, so what exactly is that? Well, when you accelerate a motorcycle, intuition would tell us that the rear suspension should compress. I mean, it makes sense, right? Load is transferred to the rear and thus the rear suspension should compress. This is not always desirable for obvious reasons, if you think about it for a second. If the rear suspension compresses when you accelerate, you would run out of travel, meaning you won't have any rear suspension at all. Also, if you transfer too much load to the rear, the front wheel would lose traction and you would run wide in turns. The amount of anti-squat one wants depends on the riding style and overall bike setup. But generally speaking, some squat is needed to load the rear for traction. So how do you magically tune this so that the motorcycle only squats as much as you want it to? Well, it ain't magic, it's just geometry. Let's have a look at the rear end of a motorcycle. Look at where the swing arm is connected. This is called the swing arm pivot point. Now look at the rear axle. Draw a line through the pivot point and the rear axle. Then imagine a horizontal plane that goes through the pivot point. The angle between the plane and the line is called the swing arm angle. Imagine what happens if the rear wheel is driving the bike forward. Because of the upwards angle of the swing arm, the suspension is extended. The second force enabling anti-squat comes from the chain pulling on the axle in a direction parallel to the top chain run. The anti-squat tendency of the chassis changes as the suspension is compressed, because the swing arm angle is changed. Most motorcycles are set up in a way where anti-squat gradually decreases as the suspension moves through its travel. On a MotoGP bike, the swing arm pivot point and rear axle position can be altered quite significantly. So thus they can change the swing arm angle quite a lot. For most of us though, we can change the location of the swing arm pivot point. What we can change quickly though is the front and rear sprocket. For more anti-squat effect, you can fit a smaller front sprocket and a larger rear sprocket on the bike. For more anti-squat, you can also raise the rear ride height which will increase the swing arm angle. Let's zoom out now and have a look at the wheelbase, or simply the distance between the front and the rear axles. A long wheelbase has the effect of making the bike more stable but harder to transition and vice versa. Let's again compare the same motorcycles. The KTM has a wheelbase of 1481, the Aprilia RSV4 has a wheelbase of 1420, and the Multistrada has a wheelbase of 1530. The Sportster has a wheelbase of 1519, Clearly the Harley-Davidson and the Multistrada provide a stable, comfortable ride, whereas the KTM and the Aprilia are more agile and turn in really quick. An important factor to consider here is that the wheelbase changes when riding the motorcycle. The dynamics of all the components together and how their attributes change in different scenarios is crucial when discussing motorcycle geometry. But let's get more into that after we've learned about center of gravity. When talking about center of gravity, we need to know its vertical position and its horizontal position in the wheelbase. The horizontal position of the center of gravity is important for the acceleration and braking characteristics of the motorcycle. A motorcycle with an extended swing arm will have a center of gravity more forward, which will prevent wheelies under heavy acceleration. The vertical position of the center of gravity will have a big impact on the handling of a motorcycle. A low center of gravity makes the bike easier to steer in and provides more in-corner stability, but requires more lean angle for a given speed. A higher center of gravity forces the rider to use more force to lean the bike over. It provides less in-corner stability, but it requires less lean angle for a given speed. A bike with a higher center of gravity is also easier to flick from side to side. Sport bikes generally have a low center of gravity providing great stability in corners, making them easy to steer in. A supermoto, on the other hand, has a high center of gravity which requires slightly more force to steer in, but also requires less lean angle at the same cornering speeds. 
<laughs> now you know why the local supermoto guys are passing you in the corners. <laughs> now let's circle back to the so-called setup. But this time, let's use the knowledge that we've learned in this video so that we can understand this a little bit better. When the rider brakes, the weight will transfer forward, the trail decreases, the wheelbase decreases and the swing arm angle increases. This makes the bike unstable, but also very easy to turn in. What you want is to set up the bike so that it will turn in as aggressively as possible while not causing the rider to crash because of instability. That is the goal of suspension and geometry tuning for braking. When the rider accelerates, weight will transfer rearwards. So the trail will increase, the swing arm angle will increase and the wheel base will decrease. The motorcycle will become more stable and wants to go in a straight line. What you want here is maximum traction and stability. That is the goal of suspension and geometry tuning for acceleration. If you combine the two, what you want in a race bike is a bike that turns in quick but provides adequate stability. Whereas in a touring bike, you want a bike that provides great stability but still turns in at an adequate pace. You dig? I hope that you've learned something today and that this video has inspired you to look deeper into this fascinating subject. That's it for today. Over and out.